Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I know everybody has a long day ahead of them and they're taking time out so that they can enjoy meeting our new CEO of Sutter uh, Regional Hospital, uh, which is near and dear and true to my heart. Uh, has a very special place. Uh, several of my friends, including my spouse, work there. And to me, it's very important of what kind of role model that they are doing for our community to keep our community safe. As most of you know, we are a little bit a uh, change of times right now. Uh, we had scheduled Dan to be our speaker several months ago. We we're planning to feed him for his efforts uh, and for him to be able to meet everybody face to face. As we know, we're all now doing Zoom meetings and I've seen several of you on Zoom meetings earlier today and that is great. And I wanna thank everybody for being here. Basic uh, things, I have everybody on mute for now. You are welcome to put questions in the chat box. I know that he should be able to read them also. And when he is done, he can answer the questions or, and or I will read them uh, to him. And Dan, I am gonna let you do an introduction for yourself. Um, I am not wearing my mask because I'm in the building with one person who was very far from me, away from me. So uh, I figured it'd be a little bit easier to talk this way. And so I am gonna turn the reins over to you. And I really, really wanna thank you for being here, for being part of our community and for talking to our business members. Yeah, no problem. Nice to meet you all. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Dan Peterson. Um, yeah, no problem about the food. My wife's gotten into baking now, as, as so many have during all this quarantine business. So it's probably the last thing I need is more food right now. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen. Uh, give me one second here and tell me if this can, can you guys see that? Yep, and we see the also the column. I don't know if you want to make it so that it's just the one. Perfect. Yeah, how's that? Okay, good. So um, I'm gonna, uh, I thought I'd, I'll just introduce myself really briefly at the start. I'll tell you a little bit about the hospital. I know you all probably know the hospital, but some of the stuff going on at the hospital. And then I uh, want to talk about COVID-19 and what the impacts have been uh, here at Sutter Santa Rosa and, and what the stuff uh, is that we've been doing to be prepared and remain prepared. So um, this is my family here. Uh, the picture on the left is from three years ago. Uh, I have uh, that's my wife and uh, three kids, two daughters and a son. Three years ago, we were moving from Santa Rosa. Uh, this picture on the left was taken at, there's a Frisbee golf course up behind Costco up on the hill back there. Um, and so uh, this was one of our last moments in Sonoma County uh, when we moved up to Lake County three years ago. So I moved to Santa Rosa in, in 2012, to the Santa Rosa area in 2012 uh, to come and uh, run the outpatient surgery center for Sutter Health here. And so I did that for several years. Um, we bought a house in Windsor. Uh, we, we came here and uh, just loved the community and we were looking around and you know I knew that we'd be building this new campus that Sutter has on the north end of town and so we we decided to try and look up on the north end and we we saw this beautiful community in Windsor uh, we I remember uh, walking into just driving into this neighborhood and there was a little park and uh, just looking around the neighborhood where we eventually bought our house and uh, I told my real estate agent, you know, there's two houses for sale in that neighborhood. And I said, you, we, you have to get one of them, whatever, you know, however this goes, get us one of these houses. Cause this is where we want to live. Um, it's such a good family friendly, uh, environment, a great place. And we have loved every minute of, of living in Windsor. Three years ago, I did take the job, uh, as the administrator of the, of the Sutter hospital up in Lake County. Uh, I've spent the last couple of years up there and, uh, was fortunate that this, this job came available back here in the community that my wife and family and I know and love, um, and uh, was able to transfer back down here still within Sutter Health. So I've worked for Sutter for, you know, eight or nine years now. Um, and 
again, we just couldn't be more excited to be back in Windsor. So we've moved back into our old house. Um, we, uh, we decided to look for a, a little bit bigger place. And again, told our real estate agent, uh, we're only looking at houses in Windsor. And so we recently bought another house in Windsor that we'll be moving to soon. Um, but you know, we were pretty clear with our agent. We want to live in Windsor. We love Windsor. It's, uh, it's, it's where we can, what we consider home. So the picture on the right, that's not Windsor, but that's just a more recent picture of my family. Uh, my wife, Jasmine, daughters, Jaden, Adele, 10 and eight years old, and my son, Dallas, who's four. Um, so about us at Sutter Santa Rosa, um, I, I guess probably, uh, depending on where you have your pictures on your screen, on the right hand side of the screen, I have a number of our awards uh, pictured there that you may not be able to see, but um, I want to talk a little bit about that. We're an 84 bed hospital. We have 13 emergency department rooms. Really, that's not enough for, for the size of hospital that we are. Uh, in Lake County, that was a 25-bed hospital with 12 emergency department rooms. So uh, I, as you can see, proportionally, we just uh, don't quite have enough rooms in our emergency department. Uh, despite, despite some capacity constraints, even with the beds, uh, we just are, are routinely quite full here at this hospital um, because it's a great destination. Uh, you know, despite those capacity constraints, we do a really amazing job. Uh, LeapFrog is an is a independent company that does assessments of different hospitals um, on various quality metrics and things like that. They've given us an A grade numerous years in a row, actually. Um, we're on the California Honor Roll for uh, maternity and patient safety, uh, things like preventable C-sections and, and other quality statistics around maternity uh, and uh, labor and delivery. Uh, we've been on the California honor roll from the state for years. We recently uh, won a SEAL award as one of the most sustainable companies in the world um, because of our work towards uh, sustainability, things like our, our own water treatment plant on our campus and our, our extensive efforts towards, increase, towards decreasing our, our carbon footprint and, and doing things like um, solar panels, you know, for we, we generate the vast majority of our energy, almost everything that we use. Uh, through our own solar programs. Uh, Health Grades, another sort of rating company, uh, has given us an Outstanding Patient Experience Award three years in a row. Our, our patient experience scores here in, in Santa Rosa at this hospital are really fantastic. Uh, some of the best in the state year after year. Uh, top 15% of the nation for patient experience and, and top 10% of the nation for treatment of stroke, which is something that we, we have a lot of inspections as a hospital to, to audit us in terms of our performance and how well we take care of stroke patients. That's a very uh, highly scrutinized area because the, the time to treatment for stroke is so important in, in patient outcomes. U.S. News and World Reports recognized us, the American Heart Association's recognized us, and, and just numerous other, other uh, agencies. So we do a really great job. I, I genuinely am very proud of the care that, that we deliver here at Sutter San Rosa. Um, we do have some capacity constraints, and so if you come by our campus, you'll see um, that there's a lot of work going on because uh, Sutter Health has approved $158 million to expand our hospital here. So we'll be building an additional 40 patient beds, almost yeah, 67,000 additional square feet, um, an additional 21 emergency department rooms, uh, and two additional operating rooms, one additional procedure room. This is a big project for us. Uh, it'll be going on for the next two years, really. Uh, we're, we're expected to open in the summer of 2022, and then we're going back and renovating as a part of this project some of the existing space in the hospital to change the functionalities around. So we have a lot going on at Sutter Santa Rosa. We're doing a great job now, but we're really excited about this new project and being able to expand to better serve the community over the next couple of years, particularly with all the discussions, you know, around COVID going on right now. This is particularly poignant uh, in terms of increasing our hospital bed capacity here in the county. That's a big deal and it's something that, that uh, you know, just helps us more prepared as a county as well, even though, you know, this won't happen, it won't be open for another two years. It's still a good thing to look forward to. Uh, I thought I'd show you some pictures. This is our current hospital. This is a drawing of the proposed new bed tower. It's a three-story bed tower. Uh, th 
this is uh, the expansion is basically the segment that you're seeing here in this picture with the existing hospital building kind of in the background there with that swoop, the architectural uh, piece that's already out there in front of the hospital. Uh, this is our current construction site. So you can see we're just working on foundations right now. So um, the topic kind of everybody wants to talk about uh, is COVID. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're already sick of hearing about this every, every single day. But I wanted to talk to you about what our hospital's done and what we are doing, you know, what it means to us as a hospital. Um, we, we have dealt with COVID positive patients here at Sutter Santa Rosa. Um, and it is a challenge. So we haven't, we have not experienced the tremendous surge of COVID positive patients that uh, some other geographies have seen, places like New York or Italy or things, you know, places like that, that had a truly um, immense surge of patients in a very short time. We have not experienced that in Sonoma County, but we have dealt with COVID in our own way, and we have seen pretty profound impacts to our healthcare system from the patients that we have seen. We've, we've seen that these patients do generally require a fairly lengthy stay. Now, every patient is individual, but um, they do stay for quite, quite a long time, and do, um, we do utilize quite a few resources on these patients. And so even with small numbers, um, it does have a pretty large impact on our healthcare system. They require, uh, not, again, not every patient, every patient's individual, but many of them require an ICU level of care, which is our highest level of care here at the hospital and, and is very resource intensive and very um, difficult care to provide. Um, we do a good job with it. Uh, I'm really proud of the, the team here, but um, you know, it, it, it does uh, have a large impact even with a small number of patients. Uh, aside from just COVID positive patients, probably the biggest impact that we see at the hospital is screening for COVID, right? Uh, basically, any patient who comes into the hospital with unexplained respiratory symptoms or a variety of other symptoms uh, can be considered a patient under investigation. That's a patient who we um, don't know if they have COVID or not, and um, we, we classify them as a PUI until we can test them for COVID and get test results back, and that can frequently take a day to happen, right? frequently take up to 24 hours. We're actually very fortunate to be getting results within 24 hours. Many places don't uh, get results that quickly. Uh, but for those 24 hours, we have to essentially treat that patient as if they were a COVID patient. We take the same precautions with them. We need to protect our staff so that they can remain healthy to care for, um, care for our community um, and, and also not spread the uh, infections to other patients. And so um, we take all of our all of our standard COVID precautions with with anyone who may be considered a PUI until they've been ruled out, so to say, until we've received a negative test result back on those patients. That means extensive use of personal protective equipment. Um, that's been you know something that you read a lot about in the news. Um, that's been a legitimate stumbling block. Uh, it's been very difficult because everyone in the world right now, not just our state, not just our country. <laughs> Literally every, every hospital in the world is desperately trying to get personal protective equipment. And it very rapidly, in, in February, March, this dynamic very rapidly drained the world's supply of personal protective equipment. Um, things like masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, the necessary equipment to protect our staff. And so there have been worldwide shortages for quite some time now. Um, we have... Uh, we have been very fortunate to be part of a, a large integrated system that has really good purchasing relationships and a really good strategy around helping flex materials from one hospital to another when in need. And so we have always had the necessary personal protective equipment for our staff on hand at all times. So we've been fortunate to have you know, not faced a situation where we ran out of PPE. Um, but it has been uh, very difficult to maneuver uh, all the PPE that we need to the right places at the right time and make sure we're getting everyone everything that they truly need. Um, aside from that, the impacts of, of the PUI, kind of the constant stream of patients who we suspect may have COVID, um, you know, it does create a lot of just anxiety, stress, even fear at times, fear uh, on the part uh, of staff members at times, but also on the part of the public. 
Um, you know, there are a lot of questions and, and everyone kind of wonders uh, what's, what's going on. Uh, some of the other downsides to the, to the COVID era now that we're dealing with is some of the visitor restrictions that we have in place. Uh, those are not fun. We, you know, we love taking care of our patients and we want it to be a great experience for patients. Uh, we want them to have all the support that they, that they need and that they can have. And families and friends are a big part of that on a normal day. But because we're, you know, we're trying to embrace local shelter in place orders and because uh, of the importance of minimizing the spread of infectious diseases in our hospital, we have had to implement visitor restrictions that are, that are tough to do, but I feel very appropriate at this time. We've also done a ton of additional screenings, ton of additional cleaning. Um, every, every worker who comes in the building uh, gives an attestation around symptoms, is visually screened for symptoms, and is screen, has, has a temperature monitoring as well. They have their temperature taken before they're allowed in the building. That's actually true with every uh, staff member, every vendor, and every uh, visitor who does uh, eventually end up our, uh, enter our building, they're all screened for those uh, those things and not allowed to enter if they you know if they do have a temperature or something like that. Uh, so I think that that's good. You know, some of this is tough, but um, we've gone to great lengths to make sure that we are handling this appropriately, that we're taking the safety of staff and patients as our absolute number one priority, and that's really the theme out of all this. Um, so what have we done to prepare uh, at the start of March? Uh, you know, this all came out um, and, and we began to see uh, community cases of COVID. And so we went into immediate uh, action mode in the hospital. We implemented an incident command, which is a, at least a segment of our leadership team who are on site 24 seven for the first few weeks. Um, really all hours of day and night and weekends and, and weekdays, our leadership team did a tremendous job uh, helping ramp up our incident command to deal with this. What we did is we made sure um, staff had all the right training in place. That meant training them on all these new personal protective equipment. How do you take your gowns on and off correctly without contaminating? You know, How do you um, deal with COVID? What are the restrictions in place? And those things those guidelines changed almost on a daily basis as the World Health Organization and the CDC were learning more and more about COVID. Uh, we were on the phone with the CDC on almost a daily basis to make sure we were getting the most recent guidance, the most up-to-date guidance that we could get on teaching our staff how to use this PPE and how to protect themselves. Uh, because we're short on, on supplies, you know, it meant bringing in new brands, new, new styles of, of equipment. Staff all had to be retested and fit tested to make sure they all fit. Uh, thousands of hours of work went into this, making sure that everybody was comfortable with the different things that, uh, that we had for them. And so there's a pretty tremendous learning curve on that. But we've gotten through that. And, uh, and, and I can say, you know, our staff have done a really good job and have become really experts on, uh, on caring for COVID uh, patients and in protecting themselves and protecting the, uh, those patients and other patients from those infectious diseases. I'll remind you guys, for us, while there's a lot to learn about COVID, uh, it, is, it is really right up our wheelhouse. It is something that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, people tend to forget that uh, you know, we are the experts in infectious disease in a hospital. We do deal with patients with infectious symptoms really every day. And so our staff really truly are very good at, at dealing with these types of things. And they've embraced it and have become experts on COVID just as they have always been experts on, on care of patients with tuberculosis or the flu or whatever other um, infectious disease that may be. We've done a lot of surge planning too. Uh, We've, uh, you know, we haven't seen the surge here in, in Sonoma County yet, but there's always this scenario, uh, which I, you know, I still feel is a fairly realistic scenario where uh, a surge could happen. And I'm not the guy to make the predictions on that. We follow pub public health guidance on that, but uh, I can see a scenario where some of the shelter in place restrictions may be lifted and uh, community spread of the illness takes place again. and uh, you know, it, it could get out of hand, and we need to make sure that we as a hospital remain constantly vigilant and constantly ready for that. So we've got plans in place 
to increase our, our overall hospital bed count to about twice what it is right now, 50 to 100% higher than, than what it is right now. Uh, we've got plans in place to take our ICU beds. We currently have 12 ICU beds. And uh, we, can, we have plans in place to, to run two to three times that number of beds, of ICU beds uh, in, in an urgent need. We've identified additional ventilator resources. You read a lot about ventilators uh, online being a, a big shortage item uh, in critical areas. Um, and so we've, we've worked to acquire some additional ventilators. We've trained our staff to, to use some of our existing equipment, such as anesthesia machines and BiPAP machines, which can function as ventilators. And so we've trained our staff to repurpose some of that equipment so we'll have enough ICU beds and enough ventilators um, to care for uh, a significant increase in our patient volumes here at Sutter Santa Rosa. So we feel very confident in that. Um, and we're doing whatever we can do to remain prepared for that. For staff training, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've again, spent thousands of hours um, of, of staff time in training, cross-training staff from other departments, from, you know, the operating rooms, from outpatient departments, uh, from outpatient clinics, places like that, uh, outpatient surgery center, training them to be able to function as med surge nurse extenders and ICU nurse extenders, basically, to come help the teams in those areas so that we can man the additional beds. Um, not just nurses, but other staff, nursing assistants and aides and, and a whole series of other staff. Uh, so we've done a ton of staff training around that. Uh, equipment procurement, again, I talked about the ventilators and our, our, works, uh, our work to expand that capacity. So um, while we haven't seen that surge yet, uh, we've done the work necessary to be able to prepare for it. Uh, I will say um, it has not been easy to do that. Um, you know, many of you may know someone, uh, or maybe you yourselves, you know, have had to wait to have surgery. Uh, that's been particularly painful for everyone, right? Because uh, around the middle of March, when again, there began to be community transmission and we wanted to embrace the shelter in place ordinances, uh, we followed the guidance of the American College of Surgeons and, uh, and our state and local regulators. And uh, we stopped doing anything other than emergency surgeries. So we have been doing emergency surgeries all along, true, truly emergent surgeries, um, cases that uh, a patient's health would be jeopardized if, if the case were to wait, we continue to do those surgeries. But any, any cases that could be delayed um, without permanent injury to a patient, we have delayed because A, we wanted to be ready for a surge, and B, we wanted to be wise stewards of the resources that we had in terms of the personal protective equipment and the available blood products and things like that that were in short supply. So I'm glad that we made those that we made those decisions. We really had to. They were the right decisions to make. But it's been really tough to talk to a lot of patients who really want to have surgery. Most of the surgeries we do are not truly elective, anyways. They're surgeries that patients need. It's just a question of whether they need them today or can wait a few weeks. And so we have a pretty large backlog now of these, of these surgical procedures that, that people really need to get done. We have started ramping those back up now, but we're triaging the most clinically urgent of them to come first. Um, the impact of that though is, is a significant amount of lost revenue. So um, generally speaking, we do, um, we do uh, bring in a lot of revenue through our, our surgical department and through our imaging department and, and some of those other departments that we've had to shut down. So we've lost a ton of revenue while increasing our costs, not just holding our costs steady, but dramatically increasing our costs with all the cross training we've done, temperature monitoring stations, purchasing all this additional PPE, uh, added cleaning and disinfection. We've had uh, a series of additional environmental services staff members throughout the building disinfecting all the high touch surfaces, making sure that we're extra clean right now. And just the difficulties of having to staff for COVID patients that require a lot of care. So costs have gone way up, equipment costs as well. We're spending, uh, I'm not even gonna tell you the number, but 
the the amount of money it costs to to hold on to a number of extra beds here in our facility just to be ready in case there's a surge in the community. Um, the amount we spend on the tents that you see out in front of the emergency department and the, the generators and the fuel and everything running those tents, um, it really is uh, financially very, very challenging for us right now. Uh, despite, you'll see you know, in the news that there's CARES Act stimulus funding for hospitals to some degree, um, that funding really doesn't even come close to offsetting the, the losses that we're incurring, which are good. I don't mean to paint that in a negative light. Um, because we're doing that for our communities. It, it is absolutely mission critical to us to be here for our communities and to be ready if you need us, if there is a surge of patients. Um, so how are we feeling? Uh, we're all, you know, a little anxious as everyone else is right now, A, being cooped up the way that we all are, B, kind of ties into the curious piece, wondering what's gonna happen next in our community. We don't have a crystal ball any more than anyone else does, um, but we're all very curious. We're also feeling very prepared. Uh, we, feel, uh, we feel prepared, and I'll jump to my last point there. We feel really grateful uh, in our ability to prepare, because I look at some of the places like New York um, that really had a surge in a matter of a couple of days and um, I can imagine, I can truly relate to how difficult that, that would have been to handle the, you know, a huge uh, doubled patient volumes in a matter of three days um, or a couple of days. I can appreciate how difficult that would have been. Um, and so I am grateful to our community for sheltering in place. I know how painful it has been to everyone. Um, but it has prevented us from making, having to make some of the life and death decisions that, that were being made in, in other parts of the country. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that work and I'm grateful for the time that our community has bought us to prepare. Uh, additionally, we feel safe. You know, a lot, of people, um, a lot of people ask the question, is it safe to come into the hospital? And our emergency department visits are way down right now. Um, part of that is people probably just aren't coming in for things that maybe they didn't quite need to come in for in, uh, before, uh, but they just, you know, just came in to get checked out. Um, but they're doing okay at home, even though they haven't come into the emergency department right now. Part of that is likely patients foregoing care that they truly need. And so we are trying to get the message out that the hospital is a safe place. We were one of the cleanest places in the county before COVID, hospitals are always very clean because we, we have to be, that, that's our mission, to keep, our, keep patients healthy. And if we're not um, incredibly clean and do a good job with disinfecting protocols on a good day, um, you know, then we're not doing our jobs. And so I'm confident that, that we do keep our hospitals very clean before COVID, but ever since COVID, we're even cleaner. You know, we're just, we're doing even far more cleaning and disinfecting than we were previously. So I'm very confident that the hospital is a safe place to come. I put my money where my mouth is. Um, this is my son, Dallas. He fell off his bike a couple weeks ago uh, at Windsor High School in the parking lot and uh, fell off his bike and cut his chin and he needed a couple stitches. And I sat there with my kids uh, and I said, you know what? I think he's got to go in for stitches. Sorry, you know. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't too excited about it. <laughs> but my daughters looked at me and they said, but what if he gets COVID, right? What if he gets coronavirus, Daddy? And I thought, man, you know, even if in my own family, people are worried about coming to the emergency department because of that, uh, you know, then I know that's out there in the community. Uh, but I can tell you, I brought him in 100% confidently because I know how clean it is and I know the good job that our team does in infection prevention. I know all the efforts we've taken to control the spread of any infectious disease in a hospital. And so I was 100% confident bringing him in to get his stitches and his lollipop. And uh, he came home safe and sound. I was really proud of our team and the good care that they delivered. Um, so, I, you know, I do feel safe and I feel grateful to our team for uh, everything they're doing here. Um, I wanted to, you know, express my gratitude to all of you guys too, because um, 
we've seen just a tremendous outpouring of support from the community. Uh, we've, we've had tremendous amount of donations of personal protective equipment, which have been extraordinarily helpful to us. Uh, we've, uh, we've been well fed. You can see Guy Fieri down there on the left, but we've had a, a tremendous number of, of donors bringing in food for our team to lift their spirits. We've had people come bring flowers, uh, create this incredible sidewalk chuck that you can see. And I'll tell you, I've talked to the staff who have told me on their worst day, They've gone outside and looked at that sidewalk chalk and felt loved and appreciated, and then it made all the difference to them. I've talked to our staff who, who tell me, you know, just to have somebody bring them lunch, it's not even the lunch, just the fact that they feel their community support and, and thinking of them uh, makes all the difference in the world to helping helping them go on in the middle of a tough shift. So I appreciate each and every one of you guys and the support you've given to our to our healthcare workers over this time. Um, last plug, um, you know we do uh, we do appreciate your support, and if you know if you have more to that you can do to support us, uh, we're continuing to look for all those kinds of donations, but also financial donations. Here's our website. You're welcome to go. Um, you know, uh, find out more about ways you can support us either financially or through in-kind donations on that on that website. So uh, that's uh, that's my overview. I thought maybe I'd just open it up for questions. I don't know if we still have time for that or not, Lorraine. But we do. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to post, or even just tag me and let me know, and I will put you um, off mute. I, and while well, people uh, wait for people to type, um, I have the pleasure and the honor of, of being a very close friend with uh, your patient who was in there with COVID for a very, very long time. And I just saw his wife the other day and they are so grateful to the staff at Sutter, uh, the nurses in the ICU unit. Um, you saved his life and he will forever be changed um, by COVID. Um, he will probably never live another day without thinking about it. And he owes his life to the preparedness of your staff and how you took good care of him for the entire time that he was in there and how afraid he was and how afraid his wife was. Um, and that also resonates through staff who have to come and go every day and then they come home to us and how safe and secure you make them feel. So I really just think that is an amazing thing that you have to offer to this hospital and that your staff goes above and beyond because they're also community um, members. They live here too. Yeah. No, we, we do. We, we have amazing staff. We, I, I feel so fortunate to be coming in to work here at a, with a team of staff who are as incredible as they are. I cannot tell you enough good things about the staff I heard at the hospital, staff and the physicians. We, we were, the care we give is really incredible. We, we were even, um, you know, I don't know if you guys have read um, online any of the stuff about this new, um, this new drug, remdem remdesivir. Uh, which is very promising. Um, there's, you know, there's no uh, guarantees about it right now. It's still in clinical trial phases, but we were fortunate to be able to participate in the clinical trials of remdesivir. And we've published some stuff in the news recently about that, that we were one of the first hospitals in the country to be able to provide that treatment to some of our patients here um, because our team is just, is very, very uh, connect, well connected and on top of the latest science around coronavirus. Uh, it, you know, it's the, again, that, that study is, that drug is still in clinical trials, but it, it appears to be probably the most promising treatment on the market right now in terms of the potential and the initial results of some of those trials. Um, and so uh, our care really has been good. We've been able to do some miraculous things for some of our patients here. What do you see all of this may bring to you to change for the future when, when this epidemic and pandemic is over, 
I'm feeling confident it will at some point, but how do you see Sutter Hospital changing uh, through all of this? Well, I think a good example of that is our medical foundation, our physician offices. You know, Sutter wide, we've had video visits available for years. So a Sutter patient, we have an app, uh, My Health Online app, uh, and, and for years, we've had the capability on that app to be able to do video visits. And I, as a patient myself, I've used them for my family. Uh, just fantastically convenient um, to be able to just video in from your living room, show them your kid's knee or whatever it is, you know, and, and find out, you know, is this something I do need more? Like I, I do need more treatment for or not, or should I wait a day or, you know, just get some basic advice. Um, I, I've long been a proponent of telemedicine and video visits and things like that. But, but we've struggled uh, as a system to make that take hold with our patients until coronavirus. You know, we used to do maybe 50 video visits a day. We've had days now, I, the Sutter system has had days uh, when we had upwards of 7,000 video visits in a day now because that's how patients are accessing their care. I, uh, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can see, uh, I can definitely see a future world where that's a huge part of healthcare delivery going forward. And it's awesome because it, it works well for our providers. I was just talking to one of our surgeons today who was talking about how well it works for him. And it works great for our patients. Like as a patient who's utilized this technology in the past, I can tell you, um, it works fantastic. They're, like, it's much more convenient for me as a patient to be able to do a video visit from the comfort of my own home. So, uh, you know, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I can see a scenario where that really revolutionizes outpatient healthcare. That makes sense. That's great. Um, one of our attendees asks, are family members allowed to be in patients with patients who are undergoing surgeries or in uh, delivery in birth rooms and what are the guidelines? Yeah, so, um, you know, we are still a shelter in place county and, and a shelter in place state. And so we want to embrace that um, as much as we can. And uh, I'll come back to it is very important to us to limit traffic within our facility because every person, every additional person that comes in the facility, no matter how much screening or how much masking and things like that that we do, um, it, you know, the more people in the facility, the greater the infection control risk and the more difficult that is to manage. So we do have a no visitor policy right now with a few exceptions. One of them uh, would be a, uh, a mother giving birth to a baby, uh, we do uh, allow one support person in, uh, generally a spouse, but it, you know, for some, some people don't have that and, and, or some people prefer to bring a, a different support person in with them. So we allow a support person. Um, I, I do feel that makes a difference uh, in, in a mother's delivery, having someone there with them uh, as a support person. Um, we have several other, um, exceptions that we can make, but we, we review them all on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So an example might be an end-of-life situation. We, you know, we could allow limited family members to come and say goodbyes, their last goodbyes to a patient in an end-of-life situation. Uh, a minor patient who needs, who needs a parent with them, or a disabled person who needs a caregiver or parent with them. Um, those are some examples of exceptions that we make. We are not currently making them for surgeries. Um, I, know it, uh, I know how important it is to patients to have a, a visitor with them, but we're just we're trying to balance that with um, what we feel is an even more important imperative to keep our facilities safe um, from infectious diseases right now. Uh, and so there, there could be scenarios where a visitor is allowed for a surgical patient, but it would largely fall under our exception criteria and each would be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Perfect. Um, are you able to read the questions? Someone posted it to yeah. everybody. So I uh, mentioned uh, they're prepared for COVID-19 resurgence if it happens with the governor starting to loosen up restrictions statewide. My question is, what timetable is are we working within to keep the hospital in high alert status before starting to loosen restrictions at the hospital? 
Well, we have already begun to loosen some of those restrictions at the hospital, for example, with the surgeries. We have gone from doing only emergent surgeries to now doing some of the medically necessary time-sensitive procedures that were not classified as emergent surgeries. So we have reduced, you know, lowered our criteria for that um, somewhat already, and we will likely continue to, to lower that as we can. Um, but that is, um, that is really just an ongoing monitoring thing. So as we started doing that, we've kept a close, close eye on our personal protective equipment stores throughout the Sutter Health system. And, and we can only do that in a gradual phase approach because we need to make sure that, you know, if we just open the doors wide open right off the bat and then burn through all of our PPE in day one and have nothing left, if there is a surge later on, we're going to look really foolish then, and it, it wouldn't be doing right by our communities to do that. So any of these loosening of restrictions and things, we're going to do gradually and in a phased approach. Some of that does have, have to do with statewide restrictions. And so, for example, we also didn't want to begin doing more surgeries until the governor and the county had, had said that that was okay as well, because we didn't want to go out there and fly in the face of our, of our governmental authorities. Um, so it's a balancing act between the government, government, I don't want to call them restrictions, it's really, they're there for our own good, the government regulations and our internal capacity, making sure that we have capacity to loosen those restrictions without compromising our ability to be prepared for a surge. Um, so we've begun doing that, we'll likely keep doing that. I couldn't speak to a specific timetable because it may change, you know, if, if, uh, if the shelter in place uh, ordinances are loosened up in the community and then people start going out and mingling a lot more in the community and we see a huge uptick in, in uh, prevalence of community spread, then, uh, and, and then we start getting a ton more patients in the hospital, then, then we may ramp up the restrictions once again to make sure that we can take care of the emergent patients that we need to take care of. So it's kind of a... Um, we're gonna we're gonna do that in conjunction with what we see happening within the community and what we see as our availability of services at any given time. Uh, Dan, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Sutter Hospital was accepting donations of PPP, PPEs. Um, are you still doing that, or has that stopped? No, we we absolutely are. Yeah, so. Um, you can bring in PPE. Uh, we have signs up on our campus directing you for where to go for PPE donations. Um, you're welcome to call ahead if you'd like or, or just uh, bring it in and follow the signs. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm assuming by now everybody's pretty much tapped out of their spares, but um, just in case anybody wanted to know that. so. Um, and I, I really can't say thank you enough to the people who have donated to those of you. It's, I felt just such a tremendous outpouring of support from our community. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, this is a pretty amazing community. Um, in fact, uh, I was just handed, handed a note um, to read to you. Can you read the note? <laughs> nope. No, uh, let me read the note out loud. It says, congratulations for being named one of the 40 under 40 by the North Bay Business Journal. <laughs> yeah, I'm younger than I look here, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's wonderful. Good, good for you. Good for you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do you yeah, want to great, great honor, for a minute? You know, you have, you have your like two seconds of fame. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not seeing anybody else uh, with any questions. Uh, do you have anything you would like to wrap us up with? I really, um, no, not now. Um, I really want to thank you for taking the time out to uh, be part of this uh, and, and that we, you didn't get to work for food today. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. But we do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule 
um, to do this. In future meetings, we will try to get back into our regular um, routine. Um, we normally have a member of the month. This month was going to be Relay for Life. Uh, and we have changed the date for Relay for Life until September. So we will have that person in August. So things are changing. We're trying to get in the groove just like you guys are. And again, I appreciate you answering my email going, you know, Dan, I have you penciled in for the 19th. Are you still available? <laughs> Worked out great. Worked out great. Well, thank you again. And I want to thank everybody for being here, taking time out. And uh, this is being recorded. So we will send the link out uh, to everybody uh, after we are done with it. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you, Dan. Nice to meet you all.